What's going on, everybody? This week's question, the question that, well, I asked a week ago to all of you that I've been reading some amazing responses to was I asked, what is the greatest find, the greatest purchase of your collecting history? You know, and I shared a little story about how I bought an 89 Upper Deck Dale Murphy reverse negative card for 25 cents and ended up selling it for $100. You know, and for a kid, I was like rich, right? You know, at one point a while back, I shared the, the story of my dad where he bought two Joe Montana rookie cards and they were pristine. One of them he ended up selling for a couple hundred dollars. The other one he held on to for years and years and years, eventually sending it into PSA. Eventually he had ended up in a PSA 10 holder. So for $25, he made $175 of profit plus a PSA 10 Joe Montana. So that was a pretty good deal too. And several of you have been sharing some of your best stories of your best buys. And some of them you've been sending to me, you know, in the comments below. But I've had several emailed to me as well. Now, while there were 15 incredible stories, I narrowed it down to six. And those are the six I want to share with you guys today. Really incredible deals, incredible scores for others in the collecting community. Let me share with you the first one right now. In fall of 2022, my family and I went to a large flea market. Nearing the end of our day there, I finally found two vendors who were selling baseball cards. One of them had some showcases with stars, hall of famers, etc., at typical card show prices. But then I noticed that there was a table of discounted cards, some up to 50% off. So I started digging through those value boxes, and within the first minute or so, I found the card below. A 1973 Mike Schmidt rookie card with the price tag of $5 on it. I ended up buying it for $2.50 after the 50% discount, and I was thrilled, but worried it could be counterfeit. After checking with some of the gurus on net 54 who confirmed that it looked authentic i ended up sending it in through a net 54 member to get graded by psa after four plus months of waiting it finally came back as a psa 5. as a kid growing up and collecting cards in the mid to late 80s i never thought i would be able to afford a 73 tops mike schmidt rookie card i could buy one at retail prices now if i really wanted but never in a million years would I have guessed I'd get mine for the low, low price of $2.50 plus grading fees. It may be the best score of my 39 years of card collecting. Now, there are several things I love about this particular story. Number one, the fact that that deal was in the box at the flea market. Like, how many other people had gone through that 50% off box at the flea market and gone right by the Mike Schmidt card? Like, how? I, I just wonder, how long was it there? Had they just sleeved a few cards and added them? Or was that there for a long time? Uh, super interesting, makes me very, very curious. But to make the buy, and, and my thought process was, was exactly the same as I'm reading it at first, was like, well, I mean, if it was if it was on sale for five dollars and fifty percent off, and it's a Schmidt rookie, and this is not all that long ago, well, it's probably you know a reprint or a, a fake of some sort. So then, when it gets sent off, and it gets the grade of a five, which makes it a very valuable card. That's an expensive card. That is a super cool find, and it it just goes to show. Even when you're going to flea markets and card shows and card shops, go through those boxes. I am not a guy who is just a showcase uh, shopper. I am not a showcase shopper exclusive person at card shows. I love digging through the boxes. I love checking out what deals might be in store. And when it's a variety of cards from a variety of years, 
Those are especially exciting because you don't know what the next card is. You might go from an 87 tops, you know, Jose Canseco to the next card be a 1958, you know, Brooks Robinson. You just never know. So when you see those value boxes, especially the mismatched ones, especially at the dealer who doesn't look like a professional dealer and looks like more of a flea market type dealer, go through the boxes. The fines are out there and that's the proof that it still happens. My best purchase by far was back in the summer of 2018. Back then, I was a longtime collector of vintage baseball cards, but decided to buy my first basketball cards. So I purchased a 1981 Magic Johnson PSA 10 for $340 and a 1981 Larry Bird PSA 9 for $50. I stashed them away, happy to have both of the first solo cards in my collection, but not thinking much about their future value. Fast forward to 2021, when cards were going crazy, and I saw that a PSA 10 Magic Johnson card had just sold for over $25,000, and a PSA 9 card had sold for over $1,000. Needless to say, I dug mine out and put them both up for auction and netted over $30,000 for the Magic Johnson and almost $1,500 for the Larry Bird. This was pretty close to their peak prices, as both have come down in price since 2021, but still remain pretty high. Looking back, the crazy part is how low the prices of the high-grade versions of these two cards were selling for in 2018, just three years before the boom in 2021, and how much they are still worth even today. There were plenty of them being bought and sold, in 2018 at those same low price points that I originally bought them at. Although I am obviously thrilled with how that worked out, my only regret is that I didn't have the foresight to buy much more of them back in 2018. Oh my goodness. My goodness. My guy scored well over $30,000 in profit in not a very long time. Now my mind, my mind, <laughs> so there's so many places that I could go with this one. Number one, why would that Magic Johnson, 81 Tops Magic Johnson ever have gotten to $30,000? I know it's a 10, I get that it's a 10. I get that those cards have centering issues. But $30,000 for a second year Magic, I know it's his first year card. A second year Magic Johnson for $30,000. That is very, very interesting. Now the nine Larry Bird for $1,500, that, is, that makes a little bit more sense. But still, that's a lot of money for a card from the 1980s. From the 1980s. Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, good for you for the score. And that is a massive score. And good for you for timing it and selling it when you sold it. I mean, it sounds like it was like at the peak. Now, there's another thing that was mentioned in this comment that I think is worth noting. A lot of cards have crashed down to earth. And a lot of cards have come down a little bit, but still remain very high. Why is that? Why would a second year, you know, Magic Johnson in a 10, and I understand it's a 10, why would that card still be high? And when we say high, I don't know how high it is right now. I'm assuming it's still several thousand. If at one point it was 30,000 and the comment says it went down a little bit. But why would that card be worth several thousand dollars still? So interesting. It's so interesting that some cards are way down from the peak and some cards aren't as far down. It kind of seems to me like a lot of it is the stability of the big names or were the cards underpriced? <sighs> I don't know. Really interesting story there. I've got four more for you. Let's check out the next one. One of my best deals was a purchase of a T206 Red Cobb in the early 1980s. 
I bought it raw for $190 and later had it graded. It received a 7 from PSA. It is one of the few cards I kept from my purchases at that time. I believe a PSA 7 sold for about $90,000 recently. Better to be lucky than smart. Now, there is a lesson for sure to be learned from this one. This is a much more predictable situation. The situation here is we're talking about a rare, high-demand, all-time great, pre-war card in really good condition, right? It, it checks all the boxes of things that would have value, hold value, and go up in value. I was just literally today, I was teaching my business finance class about depreciation and how to calculate depreciation and what depreciation is. And the thing that I was really spending a lot of time trying to go outside of what the book is talking about just mathematically and how to calculate things to like life lessons. And the life lesson was people who are poor and don't have a lot of um, wealth, they tend to spend most of their money on things that depreciate in value and depreciate quickly. And people who have a lot of wealth tend to put a lot of their money over their lifetime into things that appreciate in value. For example, you know, clothing depreciates quickly. Cars depreciate quickly. If you don't have a lot of money, you wouldn't want to put a lot of your funds into those things that go down quickly in value versus somebody who isn't renting but buys a home, which appreciates in value, who is putting money and saving into the stock market. It's appreciating in value. And one of the topics that we brought up or I brought up were collectibles. Now, whether it, the collectible is, you know, a, a Picasso painting or it's, you know, collectible cards or things that are going to have lasting collectability. Not things like Beanie Babies, <laughs> but maybe things like, you know, a, a 68 Camaro, right? That would have some appreciation over the long term. Now, that's exactly what happened here. It is very predictable to think that a Ty Cobb card will continue to have a slow and consistent appreciation. My dad had a friend, has a friend, who years ago ha said a quote that we still joke about today. And his friend had just bought a house and he's telling my dad how he had just bought the house and he said, yeah, you know, it's really depressing to know that everybody on the street lives in a house that's just like yours, but you're paying more to live there than everybody else to live in the same house. And the point is that because housing in, you know, 99 cases out of 100 is a slow increase in value. So that slow increase of value means whoever gets in first has the best deal. And whoever gets in second has the second best deal. It's the same thing with things like Ty Cobb cards or Babe Ruth cards. The person who bought it longer ago bought it for less than the person who bought it most recently because things like that are just a very slow crawl of appreciation over a long period of time. And when we're talking about a situation like this of 40, 50 years and a Ty Cobb card and a T206 card and in a high grade like a seven, and a portrait Ty Cobb T206, it's just a climb on up the mountain of more and more and more value. My best deal was trading for a 1986 Fleer Michael Jordan at a comic book store when I was in high school around 1999. I traded some Magic the Gathering cards of equal value to get the Jordan. The Magic cards I traded away have gained some value, but not nearly as much as the Jordan. I almost forgot about that card while I was in college, and I sent it to BGS around 2007 after graduating. 
it came back an 8.5. I think I profited about 4,500% comparing current values. Still have the Jordan card to this day. I considered crossing it over to PSA, but I kind of like that my Jordan is encapsulated during a time when card cleaning wasn't prevalent. Now, there are not many cards that are more iconic than the Michael Jordan rookie card, no doubt about it. And I'll be the first to say, I know nothing about Magic the Gathering cards. So making a good or a bad trade when it comes to anything TCG, I am not the person to know the deal. But it sounds to me like you got a pretty good deal. Now, there was something in this comment that may be overlooked that I think that we need to not overlook and really take a hold of it and look at it and think about it and really critique it. And that comment was, I kind of like having the, and I'm paraphrasing, I kind of like having it in an older holder because that's a time when card cleaning and, you know, all that phase that we're in apparently right now wasn't happening as much. Now, something that a lot of people have been asking is, hey, Greg, do you think the older holdered cards, the, you know, second, third, fourth generation PSA holders, we're in generation 10 slash 11 right now for PSA holders. Do you think these older holders, do you think the older SGC holders will actually hold their value more because those cards were holdered at a time where a lot of the card cleaning and stuff wasn't as prevalent. Now, I don't know when card cleaning really fired up, but I can tell you that card trimming has been around for a long time. That has been around for a very long time. As far as the Kurtz card care, sure, the kits to clean up and restore the cards are newer, then, but I think people have been soaking stuff for a while. I think people have been, you know, doing some manipulation for a while, but it does, does seem like with some cards, it's becoming more mainstream. And I think that that's an interesting hypothesis. Now, the reason I kind of lean against thinking that's the case, uh, that, that the older holders will be better and more valuable in the future is really because I think people feel that the grading standards have gotten tougher. And so if the grading standards have gotten tougher and the technology that's used by the different companies has gotten better, I think it's actually more likely that things would be getting caught now than they were 20 years ago. And I think that the grading standards are tougher now than they were 20 years ago. So not in every case, but in a lot of cases, I do think actually that the newer holders catch more stuff and the newer holders hold cards to a higher standard. So it's an interesting hypothesis. I may end up being completely wrong on this one, but that's kind of where I'm at. And I think that it's an interesting thing to kind of kick that idea and that topic around because I think it's worth discussing for sure. My best deal. 1993, working a summer job between college semesters and at the Houston TriStar show with my dad. I saved all summer and bought a $300 framed cut Jackie Robinson auto. Fast forward to 2019, I opened the frame up and discovered a fully signed postcard with best wishes hidden. Graded the postcard and it received a PSA 10 auto. I sold it for $6,000 and combined with some other funds, I purchased my Grail card, a 52 Tops Mantle PSA 2. Now, this is this is like straight out of a movie, right? Like, you know, I, I don't know if there are, I don't even remember. Are there movies? Is there a movie where behind this painting is this other painting? You know, I know that there have been books written on that same sort of thing. And I'm sure that there have been some fines on, you know, Antiques Roadshow or something where behind a, a, a painting was an original, you know, Van Gogh or something. And that's kind of what this is because let's face it, you know, a cut auto versus a full 
you know, kind of page paper with a met, like that is definitely uh, the premium is on the the regular paper with the regular autograph and maybe even the best wishes where there's writing included versus like a cut auto. Now, don't get me wrong. I'd love to have a Jackie Robinson cut auto, but what was found behind the frame to be the complete document paper is is a superior item to what he thought he was buying. One of the reasons why I think it was able to sell for so much more. So literally that one feels straight out of a movie and it's super cool. And hey, you had a super cool item in the Jackie Robinson autograph and now you have a different super cool item in the 52 mantle. But hey, some good fortune helped to get a little bit closer to your grail card. And at the end of the day, the, the, whole, the whole term of a grail card really is the, the ultimate thing that you're searching for. And you were able to do that and were helped by this story that you shared with us. Super cool. Last one. Let's take a look. It's around 1992. I'm single, a big baseball fan, and a casual card collector. I go to a show here in Atlanta and see a card I'd never seen before, and I have to get it. My mother was born in Brooklyn in the 1920s and, not surprisingly, became a Dodger and a Jackie Robinson fan. The card was his 48-leaf rookie. It had serious print marks, but its centering and corners were excellent. I bought the ungraded card for $300. A few months later, I consigned the card at a local shop asking $350 for it. I still have the business card where the shop owner wrote on the back, Received of Keith on consignment, a Jackie Robinson rookie in EX condition. $350 to be returned in the event of a sale. 9-18-93. Most fortunately for me, it didn't sell. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Fast forward to around 2015. Our youngest daughter is learning about Jackie Robinson at school. So I try to put my hands on the card to show her. I have no idea where it is. Unfortunately, I can't find it and forget about it. Fast forward to the 75th anniversary of his breaking into the major leagues on April 15th, 1947. I am becoming aware the card is worth way more than I had paid for it. My mother is no longer with us. So the card has sentimental value, and I can't put a price on it. I've got to find the card. I look, and I look, and I look. I likely put 40 hours into the search. I can't find it, and I'm distraught. Finally, I give up looking. I tell our three kids, when I die, don't throw anything away without first looking through it thoroughly at what it is. One day, my wife said to me, Do you know you have some cards in the desk drawer? Within arm's reach of our bed. Yes, I know. My 1953 Bowman color cards are in that drawer. One day I was looking for my 1953 Bowman color Gil Hodges card and couldn't find it. Do we see a pattern here? So I looked in that drawer. At the very bottom, face down, is the Jackie. I sent it off to PSA to be graded, and it got a two and cost me $700. Man, what an awesome way to wrap up this episode with that story. The the ups and downs, when I was reading over this one, and this one was one of the emailed uh, messages to me, I was literally on the edge of my seat going, wait, is it, oh, wait, but? And and the, you could feel the drama and the tension and the excitement through the words and the way it was written. So well written, such a cool story. The connection to... You know, his mom, the the card being lost, the daughter learning about Jackie Robinson at school. I mean, there, there's so much to that story that makes it such a great story and such a great way to wrap this up. Now, let me say a couple of things. First, thanks for those that submitted their stories because that was super, super fun. And I always encourage everyone to participate. That's the whole point of this channel is to share stories, share ideas, share thoughts, share concerns, 
be a place that we can all kind of connect and talk about this stuff. And I want to go back to the second to last response, the one about the Jackie Robinson autograph. The Jackie Robinson autograph was a really cool one because he ended up scoring his grail card out of the whole thing. And that story helped tell the story of how he obtained that grail card. So for this week's question I have for everybody, what is your ultimate grail card? What is the card that you want most? Now, everybody has a different different definition of a grail card, but I don't want it to be just about price because we would all say, oh, well, the Honus Wagner, because then you could sell it and then you could buy a whole bunch of other stuff. But what is the card that you legitimately hope that someday ends up in your collection that you feel has a legitimate chance of making it to your collection? Not the one of one, you know, uh, what Joe Jackson card that was lost and is, a, you know, what is the realistic grail card for you and your collection that you think you'll end up with someday or at least hope to? And in addition to that, if you have the grail card, if you were able to obtain that ultimate card, what is it? And tell us the story of how you got it. I'm really excited to hear these stories. What cards you guys want most? And it doesn't have to just be baseball. It could be football. It could be basketball. It could be hockey. See, I even said hockey. There you go, hockey guys. So that's my question for this week. Before I go, one last thing. Just a couple of days ago, I opened up submissions for the monthly midlife community show and tell. If you have a card that you picked up during the month of March that you want included, please, down below in the description, I've got a link to a Google form. In that Google form, it's gonna ask you a few quick questions and give you a spot to upload a picture of the card that you want included in the show and tell for the month of March. I hope that you'll submit a card. I love going through everybody's pickups and I love making that presentation to show everybody what the rest of us picked up during the past month. 